<laughs> I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And these are our incredible stories. <laughs> we're so happy to have you back with us. Oh, I tell you what, uh, we're getting ready for the holiday seasons. You know, you get that feeling in the air, and it's just so nice because now we get to spend Christmas with the family. Today, we are going to reminisce about some of our past Christmases, and uh, you are going to be sharing a story with us about your trip. Where, where did you go again? I went to uh, Europe um, my first year as a teacher way back when, and I uh, had some incredible Christmas experiences there. Oh, fantastic. So we're going to get started with this. Sit back, relax, and enjoy a little bit of the holiday spirits with us. On daughter, on Blitzen. (laughs) So looking back, um, I I think about Christmas uh, growing up and... um, I remember quite a few Christmases where uh, it was just, we did things that uh, were always unexpected, uh, whether it was trips or um, little events at home or uh, whatever. And um, some of my fondest memories were the ones that uh, were of you trying to recreate a Christmas movie, either Christmas Vacation or The Christmas Story uh, with, with Ralphie. And uh, I think we had more than our share of um, Chevy uh, Chase-styled Griswold Christmases where something either fell over, broke, or didn't exactly turn out the way we had planned it to. And I remember a Christmas or two where I hid the Red Ryder Daisy BB gun behind the couch and you had opened all your presents and I asked, uh, well, Gary, did you have a really nice Christmas this Christmas? Mm, yeah. As, and then, oh, oh, is, is that something behind the couch? Mm-hmm. Ah, what is it, Gary? Yeah, well, I mean, as much as we want to believe that's how it happened, actually, it was behind the refrigerator. <laughs> well, that's cool. I was close. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it, it was a, a pellet rifle. I, I remember that very clearly. I was about seven years old, and uh, it was a, a nice, brand new pellet rifle that was hidden right behind the refrigerator just off to the side of the roach trap and there it was in all of its glory that shiny black plastic and uh, i remember the the first one that you got me um i had got it out i was so excited we were going to go out that christmas morning shoot it in the backyard and what happened the trigger fell off and so did the safety and at that point i figured "Mm, it's probably not going to work out too well for me and i was thankful because at least you didn't shoot your eye out (laughs) that's a good point i do have both of my eyes Although I am visually impaired, I still have two of them in a pair of glasses. Um, But uh, the uh, the one that we bought to replace it worked out pretty well. But yes, I do remember a lot of those wonderful memories um, as a kid growing up. Um, And and one of our family traditions has always been, um, and I'm sure many of you probably do it, is watch the 24 Hours of the Christmas Story, which I think hands down is one of the all-time great classics of the christmas season that's on uh is it turner network television that does that tnt and tbs show it for 24 hours every christmas and christmas eve yeah ralphie uh his uh name is uh, peter billingsley yeah the actor who played ralphie Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now um interesting story about that is that um uh, gene shepherd actually wrote the book um, in God we trust, all others pay cash. And these stories that were in the book were based off of things that happened in his life growing up as a kid and uh, his family. And there are a great other many stories in that book, but that particular story when he had his radio show is one that he would share every year on the radio and um, tell about how uh, Ralphie Parker uh, had aspired to have his Red Rider BB gun and all of the misadventures that he went on with his friends Flick and uh, can't think of some of the other ones and dealing with Scott Farkas. So um, much in the way that we're doing this now, um, somebody else was doing it way before us. Yes, and some of the same 
stresses that uh, surround the holidays are brought out in that uh, movie also. Uh, the dad was uh, absolutely determined to get the perfect Christmas tree, and uh, there were adventures connected with that, misadventures, I should say. Oh, that's true. Um, yeah, from uh, trying to uh, haggle with the uh, the Christmas tree salesman to, to get the uh, tree that he wanted, uh, all the way up to the uh, the Bumpus's dogs coming into the kitchen and tearing up the uh, turkey. Yes, and we have always, one of the highlights of our uh, Christmas celebration has always been the Christmas dinner, which mom has prepared for us. And, and uh, it, uh, it just, uh, the table's just grown with food and everything has to be just so perfect. And, and uh, to watch in the Christmas story and see what happened uh, to their feast, uh, everybody can identify with the disappointment connected with that. Oh, I think so. But even more, I think um, besides Christmas story, a lot of people, and I mean a lot of people, can definitely identify with Clark Griswold in Christmas Vacation, which has also been one of our big family traditions to watch. Um, and hands down, I think one of the funniest Christmas movies ever made, from uh, Chevy Chase performance as Clark to um, Cousin Eddie, who I think is one of my favorite characters in the entire film. I think every family has a Cousin Eddie. I think every <laughs> every family does have and And even if you say, eh, you can think back on that one person who always shows up, and you think to yourself, why this year? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. And, I've, of course, everybody's father is Clark. Um, whether, and I know that uh, there have been more than enough times that you have shown up with your Christmas hat on and uh, overly enthusiastic and, and very pumped up about something we were going to do that was a spontaneous Christmas moment. And, uh, and either it works out beautifully or we end up having to adjust our plans. Maybe not to the same point that Clark does when he uh, blows out the fuse or on the, the whole city grid with his light show or uh, bringing home a uh, Christmas tree with a squirrel in it that ends up attacking everybody in the house. Um, but we all know that... Uh, Dads all out there worldwide try their best during the holiday season to make it the very best it can be for their family. Yes, and unfortunately, uh, this year we have a new set of challenges uh, facing us as we look uh, toward the Christmas holidays, and that is the current pandemic, which is uh, a challenge all around the world, not only here in the United States. And that's going to impact the way we have celebrated in the past. Uh, you know, some of the past traditions included, like you say, going out and getting the Christmas tree and decorating it. Uh, in the past, uh, we used to send lots and lots of Christmas cards, not so much anymore. And in the past, uh, we used to love to uh, go into the department stores and do our Christmas shopping and go elbow to elbow with all the other Christmas shoppers looking for the uh, Christmas bargains and what have you. And, and this year, it's, uh, it, it just can't be as it has been in the past. Uh, we all are going to have to adjust our holiday. And perhaps one of the best ways we can adjust it is to remember a couple of these uh, classic Christmas movies and put them on our schedule for watching over the, over the uh, Christmas season uh, there's some other classic films, too, um, um, in addition to the vacation, uh, Chevy Chase vacation uh, movie, the uh, Christmas Vacation, and uh, also The Christmas Story with Ralphie. Uh, what was the name of the one that uh, was the real classic? Um, uh, Miracle on 34th Street? Yeah, or Miracle on 34th Street was one of them. There's a, there, there are other classics, too, that... Oh, It's a Wonderful Life with yeah, Jimmy Stewart? Yeah, that's, that's the one I was thinking of, uh, with uh, Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can fill some of our holiday with these uh, motion picture treasures. Mm, yeah. And we can vicariously, you know, experience the Christmases of the past mm -hmm. through watching these wonderful movies. So that's one thing we can do uh, during the pandemic. The pandemic won't stop us from that's doing true. something that's like true. that. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be different. Uh, you know, this year, carolers will be dressed in hazmat suits, and <laughs> the reindeer will have, you know, little protective garments over their hoofs. But, you know, Christmas is still Christmas. Yeah. Um, I know one thing I'm going to truly miss, because it's a big thing um, uh, with my wife and I, uh, Danielle, uh, every year uh, since we've been, since we had started dating all the way up till now, 
um, that were married, we would do Black Friday and go out and do the Christmas shopping. And we have our traditional outfit that we wear, which is our big coats. Even though uh, we are in Florida and we have tropical climates, sometimes it gets a little cool during the Christmas season here. I stress sometimes. Uh, and then the times that it's not cool, then we leave the coats at home and put on some shorts. But for the most part, we have our big coats on. And then uh, we have these, uh, my wife likes to refer to them as squirrel hats. These giant brown fluffy hats. Uh, hers actually looks like a squirrel with the little ears sticking up. Mine is kind of a traditional um, hunter's cap made out of uh, faux fur because, of course, I'd rather go with fake fur than real fur. But that's just my choice. But we like to wear our hats because we know we're going to stick out. Um, and if uh, somebody gets separated in the store, um, well, it won't be too hard to find because we're the only two people in the entire store wearing squirrel hats. So, um, but uh, it's something that we've always looked forward to. And we like hitting all of the major stores and traveling around, trying to find the bargains, the little things we weren't expecting to put in other people's, uh, you know, stockings or under the tree. And uh, I think that's one of the things I'm going to miss the most uh, this year because, of course, we are going to stay inside and socially distance, you know, um, and and that'll be kind of hard because, uh, you know, we, we like going over, getting a cup of hot chocolate that we're going to take along with us and and be a part of that experience. You know, it's um, everybody has kind of set up these uh, traditions that, like you said, are going to have to be altered this year. Yes, and uh, I'm, I'm just hoping that uh, you folks who are, listening to us at this time are making your plans to have some kind of uh, celebration this holiday season, whether it's Christmas or Hanukkah, uh, whatever you might be celebrating. Uh, don't just give up on it and say, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, not going to happen. Uh, make something happen. You can do it in a safe manner. You can make it uh, happen in a most enjoyable and memorable manner. It just takes a little bit of uh, creative thinking and uh, some flexibility and I have every confidence that you will enjoy a real memorable holiday this year. Mm -hmm. And speaking of memorable holidays, um, that brings us to our story for this episode. And we're going to actually travel back in time. Uh, we are going to travel to um, Europe because that is where you had decided to spend your Christmas one year as a first-year teacher, wasn't it? Yes, it was December 1967, and I was a first-year teacher, a newly minted teacher at that time, making the grand total salary of $5,200. Uh, I, I bragged to people that I was making $100 a week. Holy cow, you must have been a millionaire. Well, I felt like it. Um, I got a brand new car that year, and I actually uh, went off on a European vacation at Christmas time. So, uh $5,200 a year or $100 a week bought a lot more then than it uh, buys nowadays. Boy, this is just a side question real quick before you go into the meeting. How much was it to travel back in uh, 1912? <laughs> 1912. Uh, I don't go back that far, Gary. <laughs> okay, 19, what, 1968? 67. Okay, uh, December 67. of 67, the month before 1968. If I recall correctly, my round-trip airfare was $90, uh, and I don't recall how much my European package was, but that was back in the day when you had travel agents, and so I arranged my uh, Christmas vacation through a travel agent and uh, paid pretty much all of the expenses up front, and uh, I uh, traveled on the uh, cheapy airline at the time that went to Europe. It was Icelandic Airlines. And so I got to the rare pleasure of actually having landed in Iceland. Oh, okay. <laughs> in uh, December of uh, 1967. Now, it was a, a, a bit chilly there in I was going to say, I bet it was freezing. Yeah, one of the uh, mechanics who came out to service the plane, the flap uh, fell down that was covering his nose and mouth and face, and uh, it caused uh, an injury. I mean, he had a collapsed lung. Holy cow. And so uh, eventually, however, they were able to uh, refuel the plane. But they, uh, because of the ice and the extreme cold, they weren't um, able to uh, fuel it completely. And so we made a, another stop uh, somewhere um, before uh, going to Europe. I recall it was Goose Bay, Labrador. Now, I don't know whether that was going or coming back that we hit Goose Bay, Labrador, but 
uh, we made an emergency stop there uh, to uh, get the plane fully fueled. In any event, um, I was in Keflavik, Iceland in the middle of the night. Uh, it's uh, just outside of the capital city of Iceland, Reykjavik. And Keflavik was where the uh, U.S. Uh, military contingent was based. And I'll never forget walking through that terminal and uh, seeing behind the glass some of the natives of Iceland there just watching us. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to them to watch all of these European and American travelers mm. walking uh, in the airport. Like and a human fish tank. Yeah, yeah. They were very interested in just watching us. And I thought to myself, wow, these folks probably don't have a whole lot to do. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Watching the Americans and yeah, Europeans yeah. traveling through their airport. Sounds so, like a local uh, thing. Anyways, uh, the uh, weather continued to... Uh, disrupt uh, the plans, uh, you know, thank goodness my travel agent was on top of everything, but um, we couldn't land in Luxembourg where we were supposed to land, so we landed in Brussels, Belgium, and said, so here's my first trip out of the country, uh -huh. a, a young person, and I'm going to the wrong country. <laughs> the completely <laughs> wrong country. Yeah, and uh, fortunately I had, uh, I uh, met a friend on the plane, his name was Wolf, and he was from Germany, and he was heading back to Germany. And so we decided to pair up at least as far as he went uh, to Germany because I was going <clears> on to Austria. And we got to uh, Brussels, Belgium, and we decided to um, eat there in the uh, city square in a, an open-air cafe. Now, Brussels, Belgium, is, Gary, is known for its cuisine. Oh, my gosh. They have the Belgian waffles. They have the Belgian chocolate. Oof. Brussels sprouts, if you like veggies. Oh, no. Yeah. I'll pass on. Give me some more of the chocolate. I'll yeah. pass on the Brussels sprouts. So, anyways, uh, they're, they're really known for their cuisine. So, uh, we were sitting there, and we heard the children's carolers come by, a, a choir of children caroling, and heard them singing the Christmas uh, carols, you know, in uh, French, I believe. And uh, I couldn't read the menu. It was in French. So Wolf said he'd order for me. And I got this delicious stew. And, uh, oh, yeah. And, um, you know, he was scratching his head, uh, trying to figure out the English word for it. And I was eating away. And then he said, oh, I've got it. I've got it. Um, it was called escargot. And <laughs> then, then he remembered the English word for escargot. Octopus. I think that's snails. 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 So you, for... For your first European Christmas meal, you had snail stew. Yeah, well, I didn't eat the whole thing. I mean, uh, once I learned what I was eating, I um, I lost my appetite. Did you? <laughs> and I decided that I'd had enough food there in Brussels, Belgium. So we uh, headed to the uh, train station and got on the train, headed for Munich, Germany, uh, because I was going to go through Munich all the way to Salzburg, Austria. Uh, Wolf got off the train sometime before that. He had invited me to come uh, visit with his family for a little while, but once again, I had this um, travel agent planned tour, and I had to be uh, in Salzburg on a particular day mm. uh, because my hotel reservation would kick in. Right. So we took the train uh, through Germany, and uh, b shortly before we uh, arrived in Munich, uh, there was a couple who got on and they were going to do some uh, Christmas shopping in Munich. Mm. So they got on the train and they were talking about in German and I speak German. So I was able to understand the conversation. Uh, and they were talking about how they were looking forward to Christmas shopping in Munich. And then suddenly they looked out the window and the train had left Germany and was already in Austria. They missed oh. their stop. Oh no. <laughs> so here they were out to do some Christmas shopping and ended up in the wrong country. Like we ended up in the wrong country when we, when we flew over. Oh, so anyhow, they had to hop another train back toward Munich. And then I arrived at uh, Salzburg, Austria. Oh, Salzburg. Mm -hmm. And I was staying at the Grand Hotel Winkler. Unfortunately, the Grand Hotel Winkler is no more. Uh, what happened? I don't know, but uh, it's no longer there. And I have to say, it was a wonderful wonderful hotel i just oh boy that was my first taste of european first class hotels 
and I loved it. Now, let me tell you a little about Salzburg as we listen to some of the Austrian music in the background. Yes, yes. I feel like we're actually there. I can yeah. feel the, the cool air yeah. of the yeah. Alps, and yeah. I can smell the smells, yeah. you know. And Salzburg oh. is definitely an alpine city uh, near the Alps. Uh, Salzburg is the fourth largest city in Austria. And I didn't know this at the time, but it's actually on the site of an ancient Roman settlement going back thousands of years. Wow. Mm -hmm. And you are familiar with this composer, Johann Wolfgang Mozart? Of course. He was born there in Salzburg. Mm. And in fact, I would end up going to Christmas Mass in the cathedral that has the baptismal font where Johann Wolfgang Mozart was baptized. Holy a, guacamole. As a baby. So... I did go to the Midnight Mass at this beautiful cathedral. Some of the church bells at that church date back to 1628, Gary. The Mass started off with Gregorian chants. Now, you don't often hear Gregorian chants, but uh, it was just absolutely beautiful music. Then uh, the priest and the entire procession, and if anybody's ever watched a uh, uh, solemn high mass uh, celebrated at the Vatican, they know what these cathedral solemn high masses can look like. They, uh, they, right. have, they have lots of processions, they have lots of color, they have lots of music, and they celebrated with a, a Beethoven's Mass in time of war. And I've always wondered, why did they pick Beethoven's Mass in time of war? Because oh, that is a good question. Christmas time, but it was a beautiful Mass, nevertheless. And, uh, you know, the title didn't matter. It was absolutely beautiful. And then, once the Mass was over, the uh, choir was silent, and the organ went silent, and the orchestra was silent. And then... You heard a lone guitar. Why would, why, why would they have started up a guitar? Well, you may recognize the carol as Silent Night. Of course. The German title is Stille Nacht. And this carol is absolutely the world's one of the world's uh, most beloved treasures. Uh, the United Nations uh, UNESCO has uh, labeled it an intangible cultural heritage. And, Silent Night? Yes. And in uh, the 1935 Bing Crosby uh, recording of it, back in 1935, mm -hmm. it continues to be, to this day, the fourth best-selling single of all time. Mm. So... Uh, Silent Night or Stille Nacht is, sti Stille Nacht is still uh, very unforgettable uh, to this day. Now, I had the privilege of the night before attending Mass in the big cathedral going uh, about 11 miles north of Salzburg to a little village called Oberndorf. And that is where Silent Night was born, Gary. In Oberndorf? In Oberndorf, Austria. Uh, and it was first played for the world, like you're hearing it now, back in 1818 on Christmas Eve. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so uh, a schoolmaster by the name of Franz Gruber, he was schoolmaster in a nearby Arnsdorf, was also the organist here at this church, St. Nicola Parish Church. And he wrote that melody, that beautiful melody that you're listening to. And a young priest by the name of Joseph Moore actually composed the words. Now, the night, uh, Christmas Eve, 1818, the reason they played it uh, on a guitar rather than the church organ was the church organ had been damaged by some recent flooding. And St. Nicola Parish Church has always had a problem with flooding in that area. And it actually ended up about 100 years later being destroyed. So in 1937, the memorial chapel, which I visited, was erected. 
So that's where I heard Silent Night performed on guitar for the first time because flooding had not only damaged the organ in 1818, requiring a a guitar to accompany the words, but flooding also ended up eventually, 100 years later, destroying the church. But that little tiny chapel up there on Oberndorf, listening to Silent Night basically the way you hear it in the background now, uh, with the uh, choir singing Stille Nacht, Heilige Nacht, was a, a memory that I carry with me to this day. Oh, what a powerful memory, too. Yeah, now, um, I loved my trip to Austria, and I would make two more trips within the next few years. And in my next trip, I ended up meeting some people who became lifelong friends to this day. Mm-hmm. Nora and Harold, and they lived in a little village outside of Salzburg called Eugendorf. And maybe in a future podcast, we can tell that story. Oh, that would be wonderful. Well, I have to say, it has been absolutely wonderful reminiscing about all of these past uh, holidays and uh, getting to listen to that terrific story of your first trip to, uh, to Europe. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to close out um, this holiday season with you this evening and uh, wish you and your uh, loved ones all the best. Hope that you all have a safe and enjoyable holiday, however you're able to celebrate it uh, in your own way. And uh, we look forward to you joining us in the new year when we start up our weekly podcast. So um, we've done these little uh, month-to-month things. And so, again, in the new year, you can look forward to more incredible stories, bigger stories, guests, and all sorts of other wonderful things. So if this is your first time listening to us, or if you have friends that you think would love listening to our stories, tell them to look for us uh, wherever they get their podcasts from and uh, add us to your playlist. And I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. Thank you again, and uh, happy holidays to you and yours. And uh, I would like to add uh, to Gary's wishes, please be safe, be happy, count your blessings. You do have many. You do have incredible stories to tell. And you have more incredible stories to make in your own lives. So celebrate however you decide to celebrate. And it will, things will work out. And I use the, uh, the mantra, together we will prevail. All right. And once again, I'm Richard. And I'm Gary. And this was our incredible story.